to this features knowledge share. Uh, the first one of these is uh, a general overview of the model um, and then uh, subsequent uh, sessions over the coming Monday afternoons will be moving on to different areas of the model. We have uh, run this internally once already uh, whilst we've been working up the model um, and so we're going to run this again now for you and kind of fixing it with the, the final decision points that we've made over the last few months. So what we thought we'd start with is a very quick kind of overview of uh, what data features really is, what kind of work we've been doing. So you can understand uh, kind of the level of scrutiny this model has gone under in the coming or the past weeks and, and years, it feels like. Um, and then I'll hand over to Ruth and we'll step through what the model actually means uh, right now. So starting off, uh, what is uh, what is data features? <laughs> what are we trying to do? Um, so uh, gen the, the program data features is is about bringing data in year. It's bringing it from what is currently a very long retrospective, and um, afterwards to bring it in year when uh, the students are potentially still at university. And so this uh, the big program has been set up to kind of deliver that um, and deliver it to to yourselves, slash your customers, uh, in more timely in a more timely way. And so it will be done on a discrete collection basis, and I'll come back to that in a few slides. Um, and at the moment, the project uh, is led by Ahisa, and we've partnered up with JISC to do the development side of this with us. So a couple of things on uh, program benefits. Um, so it's a, as I say, it's about bringing the data in year. It's about bringing that high quality data to you sooner. Um, and so it links it up with some of the processes that you're already running. So um, some of the kind of early numbers that you run, uh, the deadlines are kind of set around that so that you'll have the data available to you when you want to use it. So delivery timescales. So when is data features going live? That is the question providers are asking us a lot. So uh, the plan is uh, there is going to be a retrospective year for the first year, so for 22-23. Uh, that's the academic year 22 23 and um, there will be a retrospective at the end of that year using the new uh HESA data platform and using this new data model we're kind of working out exactly what that year means at the minute so the deadline for that isn't quite set up. then the year after so 23 24 that will be the first year of properly in-year data so three times a year uh starting in 2023 So for those of you who've not seen the, the three buckets we've got, I'll call them, uh, reference periods is what we're referring to these. Um, so there are three reference periods a year. Um, so the first couple of columns on your screen will show you the start and end date. So uh, the beginning of uh, August to middle of November, then middle of November to middle of March, middle of March to the end of July. So those are the reference period dates. So when providers are sending us data, it's anything happening between those dates uh, that, that counts in that return. We're also referring to collections, just so you're aware. So the sign off and kind of dissemination points that come off after that, um, that that's kind of our collection window. So like we have a collection now, um, it's slightly longer than the reference period, but that's just a bit of terminology in the way that we refer to it, Hisa. Just so that you're all aware, um, the Stashu customers, the discussion we've been having at our Stashu customer meetings, um, the idea at the moment is that you're going to get two different deliveries from HESA. So you'll get one for the data that refers to that specific reference period, so that kind of three months ish window. And then we're going to roll up data for the last three reference periods. So it's kind of looking at a, a 12 month picture. So in November, so with the dissemination point in December, you'll get 
the, uh, the data for, from the 1st of August to the 15th of November, and then you'll get the data from the previous 15th of November to this 15th of November. To enable you to kind of do that, that year analysis, uh, we're rolling it up for you so that you, all the SASHU customers are working off the same data set. So that's the plan at the moment. So a very quick thing on discrete collections, um, because we used to have this as continuous dis uh, collection and now it's discrete collection in data futures. It's been helpful to kind of talk through what we actually mean by discrete collections. Providers have found it quite helpful to understand this. So it's about the nature of the data. So what you're kind of returning. So for these reference periods, it's, it's the state at the end of that reference period. That's what you're returning to us in most of the data cases. There's only a few exceptions where it might kind of refer to the whole uh, reference period, but it's what is happening at the end of that reference period. Um, and the nature of the collection. So um, as with the, with the current student and student alternative collections and all of our collections, um, it is completely discrete. So they are independent of each other. So you have to return uh, the scope of the data. You have to return the whole of that record in order to submit a student. It's not just what tiny thing happened in that reference period. You then got to return the student and what course they're doing and all of that information at the same time. So they don't kind of link up with each other. Well, that's the same as now. So giving you a quick idea of uh, where we are in this model work. So as I said, we've been doing a lot of work um, over the, the past months and couple of years, I think I'd say now. And we've run a lot of consultations with providers um, from very small uh, one data item things to whole concepts across the model, like what does curriculum data actually mean? Um, and so we've got to this point um, and we're fairly confident therefore that because of the amount of scrutiny it's been under, the amount of chance providers had to feed into this, um, that the model is now stable. And we are pretty confident that that is now the model that is gonna work for data features. So you can see we've run 28 different consultations. There was just a couple of graphs to, to make it look a bit pretty. And we've had an awful lot of responses from providers and software houses and a few other organizations as well. So where we are with that, there are three more consultations uh, that we currently know of and a few more that we know might change the model. Um, I won't go into details now. If anyone wants any details, it's probably easiest to, to contact me afterwards and I can share with you the details. Um, but these are just so that we can make providers aware that we know these are coming up. Uh, we know these are things that potentially might change the model, um, but right now we can't put them into the model. So we published the model on the 31st of March um this year uh, that is the, the stable model we're calling it um, our aim is now to uh, do a release every month at the end of the month uh, to kind of update things on more guidance uh, either examples or more queries that we've had um, add more rules in when we've got them and start adding derived fields in as well the idea is kind of doing it on a monthly basis so that people get into uh, the, the habit of you know something else coming out on data features uh, once a month so what we actually published in that, the data dictionary, um, which is all the data items that you'll be familiar with, with our usual coding manuals. Uh, we also did a, a color coded version of the model, and I'm going to show you that on the next slide, what I really mean by that. We did a, a document that uh, describes what the data futures business requirements are. So this is the requirements from the SASHU customer side of this. Um, you know, what, are you, what are you actually trying to get out of data futures so that we can help explain that to providers? There's a few things around key concepts, so like reference periods that I've just mentioned, things like that, uh, to help providers and, and be a kind of a source of uh, information to refer back to. Then the last one on here, the specification overview, that is where we're setting out any consultations we've got. Uh, so the slide before, when I listed on the things that we, we know are still coming up, those things are on that web page. So we can keep everyone up to date with anything that we know might change it, anything that we become aware of, and what state that's in, whether it's out to consultation, we're still working that through, or actually we've worked it through now and there is no effect or, or there is effect either way. So the color coded model, oh, I've lost my uh, arrow. There we go. Um, so the color coded model is basically um, the, the big, we've taken a simplified version of um, the, the, the diagram that you can download from the website and put it into Visio. Um, which has allowed us just to color code areas of the model so we can help people see at a glance the amount of change we've had at the model. 
So all of the blue items on the screen, um, they're brand new concepts for data teachers. They don't really exist um, or they're not collected in, in the legacy student and student alternative. When I say legacy in here, I do mean student or student alternative, just so everyone's aware, because I will uh, keep using both terms. Um, then the other two col uh, colours, the orange and red, are kind of a small amount of change uh, or a fundamental change. Um, so yeah, this is just to kind of help them at, at, at a glance which areas they might need to focus on and which things have, have changed the most. We're not going to keep this updated because I think it's, it's a one-off thing just to help them get their heads around it. So things that are coming up next. So we did have a backwards mapping document on the website um, with, the, with the last published uh, model version we had uh, to help uh, people understand between student and student alternative and data features. Um, obviously, with all the changes we've been making, that is now not up to date. So we will be taking uh, undertaking work in the coming months to kind of update that. And when that's ready, that will be published as well. There'll be lots more guidance documents and scenarios um, as we have a thing as we're developing things. And actually, as we're doing sessions like this, um, it helps us work out which bits we need to give more guidance on, which bits aren't as clear as we think they are. And so we can add more of those um, as we go. I've already mentioned so more quality rules and more derived fields as we're working through them and drafting them up we want to try and share uh, early drafts where we can although statue customers can actually join our teams channel and um, so you can see some of our drafts in progress so if any of you not on that feel like you should be then do feel free to drop us an email and we'll work that through with you there's also going to be uh, data features the data requirements side of this so this is a document um, we started with statue customers a little while ago um, and we didn't quite finish um, and now we need to pick it back up. So this is kind of uh, not at a field level, but at an overall level, different types of data, exploring exactly what it is you want to do with this and why you need the data from us. So we can help providers, you know, understand uh, the level of detail they need to return and why they're returning things. And I'm sure there will be lots of other documents and guidance and training sessions like, like this one. <laughs> and that's all kind of coming up really. So I think that is me done. Um, I've just given you a quick overview of that. Um, I didn't want to take too long. Um, as I know, really, it's probably the data model you're more interested in, but also uh, we're likely to take a little bit longer, as we've said on that one. So we might need a break in the middle. So I'm going to pause there. If there are any questions about data features in general, um, Laura, is there any questions been typed out so far? Yeah, we've got one so far. Um, everybody else, while we're going through this one, feel free to either submit questions in that questions pane, or if you would like to verbalise your question yourself, please um, use that hand raising icon. We've got one here, um, acknowledging that this may be covered later, but somebody's asked, how will amendments be dealt with? So um, if you mean amendments to the model, um, that will be requested through our uh, main statue customer group so depending on, on where you're from request it to the, the statue customer uh, that, that speaks to sorry the person at your organization that speaks to us um, and basically um, we will work out what it is it will be put up on that web page so people can see where we're dealing with it and it depends on the scale of the project uh, of the problem I think um, but it will basically go through our normal kind of BCI process that's that's what we're, we're looking at now we've kind of stabilized it anything from here on in will be our go through our normal BAU processes. So that will probably mean filling out a business change request form. Um, I know you will love them um, and going through the, the usual questions that we would ask about the scale of the change and why we need to make the change. I'm going to take you through an overview of the data model. Um, what I've got is uh, this kind of slimmed down version of a data model here with the high level entities. Um, and we're going to go through each section one by one to give you a bit of an overview of what's the data that we're collecting and how do the different entities um, fit together in the model. Um, as this is the kind of overview of the whole model, we won't go into masses of detail in all of the sections and some of the subsequent sessions that we do, um, we'll go into a bit more detail around that. Um, so I will crack on then and we're going to start by going through the sections of the model that record curriculum data. So the providers need to tell us information about the curriculum that they offer. So um, we'll start off with qualification. So the uh, providers are going to submit to us one qualification entity for each qualification that students can aim for or achieve. And they need to give us a bit of information about um, those qualifications. So they give us a unique ID in the qual ID. Um, they also tell us the qualification category. So that's the bit that tells us what the 
qualification actually is. Is it a first degree? Is it a, an HND? Is it a PGCE, etc.? And they give us a qualification title. Um, this entity also has two sub entities with a bit more information. So they need to tell us who are the awarding body or bodies if it's um, if there are joint awarding bodies for that qualification. And additionally, what are the qualification subjects um, recorded in HECOS code? So um, for those of you familiar with the current model, slight difference here that we're recording subjects against qualifications um, rather than courses. Um, so that is, is the full information that they tell us about each of their qualifications. They tell us what is the qualification, who's awarding it, and what subjects is it in. And within the model, um, that then links to two different sections. So I said they have to return a qualification for everything the student can aim for or achieve. So the qualification can link to the course entity to say students on this course are aiming for that qualification, um, but also links to qualification uh, awarded entity, um, which we'll get onto a bit later to say that each student has achieved that qualification. It links into both sides of that, um, which you can see again in this main model. So you've got the qualification linking to the course and up to the engagement, which we'll get onto a little later. Uh, so that's qualifications. Like I said, they link into the course entity, which is what we will look at next. Um, so there's a number of um, data items that we collect here. And for those of you, again, if you know the current collection, they might look quite familiar. So we collect, is it a teacher training course, for example? Is it a closed course? What's the course title? And um, we also have that qual ID in here. So that's the link back to that qualification entity um, to tell us what the aim of this course is. Um, there's uh, one new thing that I wanted to pick up on here. We have this new fully flexible field um, and providers will return this when the course is a fully flexible course. And that can help when um, looking at the data potentially as, as uh, you know that that's the, the structure of the course and the type of provision is, is very flexible. Um, and so you might expect to see, for example, students studying at different intensities and potentially taking more breaks. Um, as with qualification, we've got a number of sub entities to collect further information. So we have um, the course initiative um, entity, and this collects any initiatives that are associated with the course. So that might be particular schemes um, that we're interested in monitoring. For example, we've got higher apprenticeships as one of our initiatives. Um, at the course level, um, this would record initiatives that would apply to every student that engages with that course. Um, it also has associated valid from and to dates for that initiative. Um, this came from feedback from providers saying that the different initiatives may only apply for a, a set period of time um, and they would rather not create new courses. They preferred their preference was to have valid from and to dates um, to say what, what's the valid period for that initiative on that course. Uh, we have a course reference entity. This one is completely optional. Um, it allows providers to record any additional identifiers for the course. They can put their own identifiers in there, um, but that's optional for them to return. That's sort of for providers' own use. Um, next, we have the course role entity, um, and you'll see this again at the module level. And um, when we have a role entity, um, what we're doing is saying that a given organization has a particular role in that curriculum. So whether that's the course or the module. So at the course level, um, what we have is for Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales, uh, we're recording which organizations are funding that course. And for providers in England, we're recording the delivery organizations. And in both cases, multiple organizations can be returned with the appropriate proportions. So you can see if there's multiple funders or if you've got um, different organizations delivering a course, you can see the breakdown of that for the full course. And finally, um, we have curriculum accreditation. So this is where we'd record um, any accreditations that that course has. And in, in this example, we're interested in, in three specific areas. So is it uh, accredited by the Architects Registration Board? Are there any uh, kind of clinical accreditations? So that would include things like the Nursing and Midwifery Council or the GMC um, and teacher training um, for Northern Ireland and Scotland. So whether this course leads to registration with the general teaching councils 
we'll come on to a little bit later where that similar information is held for Wales and England. So again, um, there we have it, the um, information we're collecting for each course. You've got some information there that's probably familiar for those of you who know the current collections. Um, and then we've got some things being held on the course level now that we haven't previously. So things like the delivery organisations in England and um, relevant initiatives. So that is your course information. Um, next, we'll look at the next part of curriculum, which is modules. Um, and again, we've got some kind of basic information about that module that we collect on the module entity. We want to know what the FT of that module is. Uh, we want to know the level. We've got a title um, and some information about the credit point and um, points and credit transfer schemes as well. Um, so again, for those of you familiar with the current return, that is almost an identical list of fields to what we have uh, in the current collections, uh, similar stuff that we're collecting there. But again, we've got some additional sub entities. So still collecting cost center information against each module. So um, this entity would be repeated for each associated cost center with the relevant proportion. Um, I mentioned there would be another role entity at the module level. So we had a course role um, and for providers in England, that was recording delivery organizations. For providers in Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales, um, we still getting that information at a modular level. So for each module, um, the organization or organizations delivering that module are recorded here for Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales. Uh, and then finally, we have module subject. Um, and as is the case in our current student collection now, that is optional for providers in England. So we've got a subject within the model against qualifications and then against modules, but that is optional for providers in England. Um, so that is the, the module data that we collect. The final part of the um, curriculum data that I'll run through is a new concept in data futures. Uh, it's this one up here, the session year. Um, what this does is it records the plan start and end date for years of a course that the provider offers. So the entity only contains identifiers and a start date and an end date. Um, I'll run through a few examples, but what that means is you don't need different session years to account for um, students doing slightly different activities. So if one student does a foundation year or one does a placement or one's part time, the other's full time, they can all be associated with the same session year as it's just recording the dates. Um, it must be a year long, um, with the exception of courses that are shorter than a year for their entirety. And the final point there that it's not required for um, PGR or fully flexible provision. The reason being that it's recording the plan start and end dates for years of a course. If you have a very flexible course, then the concept of a plan start date of a year um, probably doesn't apply. So like I said, I will run through a couple of examples. Example one, and we've got a provider that offers a number of courses that all start on the 21st of September. Um, so this could be courses across different subjects, um, that they're all starting at the same point in the year. So they could return one session year for each year that these courses run, um, starting on the 21st of September to the 20th of September the following year. So the first one, 21st September 2020 to the 20th of September 2021, and then subsequent session years for every year that those courses run. Now, as I've said, um, the session year is, is purely about the dates. So because all of these courses start at the same point, um, students linked to these session years could be on different courses, different years of programmes and different types of activity. Um, so in the year of programme example, if you had a student starting on the 21st September 2020, their first year, they'd be associated with session year one. And their second year, they'd be associated with session year two. Um, but if another student started on the 21st of September 2021, then their first year would be linked to session year two. So again, um, the session year is only recording the dates um, and different students doing different things could all be linked to the same session years. Uh, example two, so a provider runs a three-month course over the summer, and I mentioned at the uh, start of this section, 
um, session years must be a year long, with the exception where, uh, of courses that are, are shorter than a year in their entirety. So this is a three-month um, summer program that provider offers. It's shorter than a year, and so they would return one session year, three months long for each time the course runs. So they would have one over the summer in 2020, another one uh, for the following years um, for each time that, that course runs. Example three, um, a provider offers a course where students can start in September, January or April. Uh, the key with session years, uh, as I said a few times, is that it recording uh, the dates. So because they've got different entry points throughout the year, you would need different session years to represent those different entry points. Um, so you would have one starting in September, recording that, that year from that start point. Um, but additional ones starting in January and April as well. And students would be associated with the session year um, that represented the cohort that they were a part of, whether they were a January starter or an April starter. And you would then have subsequent session years to represent each year um, that the course is run with that entry point. So the key there again, that you just need different session years when different dates apply. And what I'll come on to a little bit later is how those are associated with, with the student's activity, um, which hopefully will help demonstrate some of the, some of the um, purpose of having that session year. Um, but I will pause there um, to see if there are any questions, because that one is a new concept. So, um, Laura, is any questions coming through? Um, do you need a different session year for students who start late? Uh, no, you don't. So the um, the session year is about the planned course year. Um, so if a student starts late, then that will be reflected in their activity. And that's actually one of the examples that I've got later. So hopefully that will demonstrate oh, how perfect. that one's done. And then we've got another question here. Um, with example three on session years, is there any concept that associates session years that start in the same academic year? Um, so to do with associating them, I see. So session years one, two and three would be associated because they're in the same academic year. Is that what that's suggesting? Um, hopefully that's what you're suggesting. Please let me know if it's not. Um, I don't believe we've had that conversation unless Rachel wants to jump in and correct me. Um, but I, I suppose there is so. the ability oh, yes, to. The person's just clarified. Yes, one and two and three and then four, five and six. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I don't believe we've kind of had that conversation about whether we'll do that, but I suppose it has that flexibility with the dates to group them together in that way. Um, so if that's a requirement, we could think about um, maybe derived fields or something to, to look at them in that way. Um, but I don't believe we've had that conversation yet. I don't think we have been. I think one of the reasons is, is we don't want to be limiting ourselves to just what we currently refer to as the academic year. That's why, as I mentioned in one of your deliveries, it's looking back at the last three months. So we're trying to get providers to understand that it's not necessarily the HESA reporting year anymore. It could be used at any point. Um, so, yeah, we could do it if that is, if that is relevant. And that's what, what folks want. But as we said at the minute, we're not intending to do that in the model or in the deliveries. Cool. Thank you. We've got another question here as well. Um, what is the main purpose of having session years? Uh, so I think the main purpose, and again, when we get into some examples later, hopefully it will demonstrate this, but it kind of gives a bit of context to the students' um, activity compared to the planned year. So that example of the question previously about a late starter, um, you can see from comparing the student start date to the session year start date that they're a late starter. Um, you also have examples where students might be moving between cohorts, and you can see that based on the session years that they're linked to. Um, so like I said, I'm hoping that will become more clear a little bit later, but I think that's the main purpose around um, being able to compare the students' activity to the planned um, years. Brilliant, thank you. I think that's all the questions um, we've got for this bit as we speak, but thank you everybody, keep them coming in. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I will move on then. So we've talked about uh, the curriculum data in that aqua colour, so you've got qualifications, courses, modules and session years. And um, the final part of sort of reference type data before we move on to the student information is the venue. So within the model, um, providers need to return to us one venue entity for 
each venue at which learning is being delivered and that might be their own venue but it also might be the venue of a partner so if they're franchising out uh, modules to a local college then they might need to return that that college's venue as well um, the information that we have for each venue is a unique id for the venue the venue id that just allows us to link it into the entities we'll get to later we've got a postcode so that then gives us the physical location of the venue a venue name and finally um, a venue UKPRN and this one is just for providers in England and that's recording the the UKPRN of the organization that's delivering the learning at that venue um, so when we looked at course and module and venue information you can see that delivery organizations is recorded in in a slightly different way um, depending on uh, the country of the provider so in England we had the information at a course level and now here against the venue as well uh, whereas in Northern Ireland Scotland and Wales we've got that against each module um, and that is all we collect about those venues um, so that then's all the uh, the reference data that students are going to be linked to depending on what they're doing um, we'll move on then to look at um, the students themselves so we have um, a student entity within the model I'm not going to dwell on this one for too long as, as hopefully kind of the, the concepts are fairly familiar. So at the student entity, we're collecting information about that student as an individual. We've got their person characteristics, so things like ethnicity, religion, nationality. We have some information about language proficiency for uh, Welsh speakers at, at Welsh providers and also um, a requirement to collect British Sign Language users at providers in Scotland. Um, and then we have a bit of term time accommodation information. So what is the postcode of the student's term time address and what type of accommodation are they in? Um, so we're collecting that about them as an individual and each student is uniquely identified by the SID or the student identifier that's returned against that student. A student will then have um, at least one engagement with the provider. Um, and this is what records, as it sounds like, the way the student is engaging, interacting with that provider um, towards an educational aim. So what we say is an engagement is it records a student's commitment to an educational aim. Um, the student will have one engagement for each uh, distinct educational aim that they have. And that means they could have more than one if they had more than one aim, either concurrently um, or if they had one aim, completed that and then uh, started another then they might have multiple engagements with the same provider and like the student is uniquely identified by the SID every engagement would have a NUMHUS um, and that would um, and so the combination of the NUMHUS and the SID uniquely identifies any engagement uh, within the provider's data a couple of principles in terms of the way that that's returned an engagement is opened, um, returned and given a start date uh, when the student attends the provider. So when they uh, first show up, um, or, um, then that is when at the point at which the engagement opens. So it's about their attendance. Um, we have a principle in the model about engagements not being dormant for more than two years. So if a student takes a break in learning and comes back to the same aim, then often that could be part of the same engagement. However, if they're dormant for more than two years, we wouldn't usually expect the same engagement to be reopened. Um, reason being that um, it can maybe not be said to be part of the same coherent interaction and that coherent engagement with the provider, given there has been a two year break and things like their on entry information needs to be refreshed at that point. Uh, and final point on this the new engagement is needed when a student transfers between levels so if they transfer between two aims at the same level that can be part of the same engagement transferring between levels would be a new engagement and for the purposes of engagement um, what we mean by level here is undergraduate postgraduate taught and postgraduate research um, so I'm, as I'm sure many of you are aware, in our current return, our guidance around the instance um, purely looks at level in terms of undergraduate or postgraduate. So we've broken that down further and split out postgraduate into postgraduate taught and postgraduate research for the engagement. 
Um, final point on that is that activity at different levels could be part of the same engagement if it's part of a coherent progression, um, with a common example being uh, an integrated master's course. So the student starts at undergraduate level and moves to postgraduate taught. It's part of the same um, coherent program. They signed up for that at the start. And then that could be part of the same engagement. And we do have, um, if any of you are interested in more uh, detail on that, we've got a guidance document published that goes into more um, examples and guidance around when a new engagement would be opened or when it's part of the same engagement um, and gives some more examples. So um, there's a link there if you want to um, have a look at some more detail when you when get the slides around later. So that's sort of the principles of the engagement, um, but what data is actually collected for each engagement? Well, we have um, a start date and an expected end date for every engagement. Um, we also have some information about the student that's uh, relevant at the engagement level. So that's things like their fee status or um, fee eligibility information, um, whether they're an incoming exchange student. And for uh, School Direct, students in England, we collect their lead and employing schools for that engagement. Um, a couple of additional sub entities I will run through. We have a collaborative provision entity that sits alongside the engagement and this serves two purposes. Uh, the first is to record if the engagement is part of a collaborative arrangement with a non-UK provider. So if there's a, a formal arrangement, um, this engagement is part of that between the reporting provider and a provider outside the UK. That would be identified here as well as saying whether they spend most of their time in the UK or most of their time outside the UK. And the second purpose um, is related to postgraduate research, sequential collaborative provision. So if as part of a formal collaborative arrangement, a PGR student moves from one provider to the other, now uh, the second provider would use this entity to record uh, where the students come from and the UKPRN and um, SID and NUMHUS returned by the previous provider so we can link those engagements across providers the same way that we do now with um, instances in this scenario. <clears throat> the next section then um, is student accreditation aim. Now I mentioned accreditation before at the course level um, where we're recording the accreditations that are applicable to the course. What this entity does um, is record accreditations for the engagement where um, that information isn't available at course level. So at course level we had um, teacher training information for Northern Ireland and Scotland. At the engagement level we have that for England and Wales. Um, the reason being that the coding frames in England and Wales are uh, much more detailed and granular going into specific age brackets that the students are training to teach. Uh, and Again, um, this was partially based on feedback from providers about not wanting to have a different course for all of those different uh, nuances. So it was agreed that this was um, acceptable to be at the student level instead. And then the second um, purpose is around um, clinical accreditations where the student specialises. So um, this would be an example where the course level had a generic accreditation and then partway through the student specialises. So if the course had, for example, an accreditation by the Nursing and Midwifery Council. Um, but partway through the course, students must specialise in adult nursing or mental health nursing. Then the course would say Nursing and Midwifery Council, but it, each student's engagement would record their specialism. So this is just about collecting those accreditations where we don't have enough information from the course level. And then finally, <clears throat> uh, student initiatives. So again, we had initiative information at the course level where that applies to a full course. If it doesn't apply to a full course, then it needs to be returned in the student initiatives entity for each relevant student. So one example, I mentioned that um, higher apprenticeships is one of the initiatives. If a provider ran a course where every student on that course is an apprentice, then um, they would just return that at the course level. Whereas if they ran a course where some students were in a higher apprenticeship and some weren't, then they wouldn't return it on the course and they need to return it for each individual student that it applies to. Um, 
So I, I'll run through a bit more engagement information later, but that is um, some of the information that we collect at the engagement level around the start and end dates of that student's um, commitment to an educational aim with that provider and some information um, around that. Uh, the final thing associated with the engagement is the entry profile. Um, so in here, we are interested in the student's position as at the start of the engagement. Um, and again, I'm not going to go into too much detail in this, because it's very similar information to our current collections, which I'm sure lots of you are familiar with. Um, so we're collecting information about the students' um, entry qualifications and their highest qualification on entry. We collect some person characteristics at the entry profile level rather than the student level. So things like parental education, um, care lever, and then we have some information about their previous education. So what provider were they at um, prior to coming to uh, the provider they're at now? And in some cases, um, what year did they leave the previous provider? So it's um, very similar information in there to what we have in the entry profile in our current collections. Uh, so um, at that point we run through then you've got a lot of curriculum data um, with the course the qualification and modules and the session year so the providers does us quite a lot about the curriculum they offer they've then given us quite a lot of information about who the student is as a person and a bit about their um, engagement with the provider the next section I'll run through is kind of what links that all together so we have um, this entity the student course session within the model and what's that saying is as part of this engagement the student is interacting and studying on this course so it's linking the two parts together um, and additionally linking back where relevant to the relevant session year and the relevant venue at which the student is studying so it's linking together quite a few different parts um, that we've run through um, so I'll start off then with some of the principles of the student course session. So firstly, um, it links the engagement to the course, as I've said. Um, student course session also has a start and end date, um, and in the majority of cases it will be representing one year of the student's study. So a student's on a three-year course, then over that period of time they would have three different student course sessions returned to HESA to record the activity undertaken in each of those years. Um, in some cases it will be shorter than a year and again I'll go through a couple of examples but it must not be longer than a year and within one engagement um, there must not be overlapping student course sessions. <clears throat> it's also the part of the model where we're recording the bulk of the students activity so um, what mode are they, what's their um, FTE, what modules are they studying, what type of activity are they doing, um, it's all recorded in this these kind of year-long chunks of activity that the students are undertaking. As I said, um, where relevant, this is where the student is associated with the session year. Um, as I mentioned earlier, session year is a year long with exception of co short courses. The associated student course session um, must be contained within that session year, but it might be a bit shorter. And I'll go through a few examples now of how that would work. So uh, example one, You've got a provider that offers a number of courses that all start on the 21st of September. Uh, we know this example already from the session years. They return one session year for each year that that course runs. So this provider would have returned a number of session years, um, all starting on the 21st of September and running for a year to show the different years that they're offering um, for those courses. The student um, studying on one of those courses they would have a student course session returned for each year that they studied. So um, student starts on the 21st September 2020. Um, so their student course session starts at that point and is associated with session year one. The end date of that student course session would record the point that the student finishes activity for that year. So in this example, you've got a provider that's year, whose year runs from September to June session year has to be a year long so it runs from September to September um, but the student completes their first year of their course in June and so the end date of the student course session is a little bit before the end date of the session year. The key thing is <clears throat> that the student course session must reflect 
the dates that the student actually engaged. Session year is the planned start, um, start date. Student course session is the actual dates that the student attends. So it's fine if it ends a little bit earlier, if that's when the student ended. Um, so this student in this example would then have a student course session return to represent their second year. Again, starting in line with the session year, but finishing a little bit early. And then again, same thing for their third year. So they've had one student course session returned for each year with the dates reflecting when it was that they were engaging with those years of the course. Uh, example two relates to that question that we had around session years. Um, so a student joins a course a month late, um, but they'll be catching up. Um, so they'll be studying. They've, they've joined a month late, um, but they're still expected to finish in time um, at the same time as the fellow students on that course. Um, in which case, they don't need to have um, a bespoke session year returned for that student because the plan date of the course was still the same and the session year is recording the plan date of the course. So it doesn't need to move for one student starting late. So uh, let's say it's that same, same session year starting on the 21st of September. Um, that same session year is returned because that was the planned start date of the course. But the associated student course session would have a start date a little later. So the session year starts on the 21st of September, the student course session starts on the 20th of October. And we can then see that difference um, between when the planned start of the course was and when the student actually started and we can identify them as a late starter. So the key again being that student course session dates reflect um, the actual dates that the student started and finished, um, whereas the session year is the planned dates. <clears throat> Um, example three, um, we've got a student that starts studying alongside the September cohort. Um, they're dormant for a term and when they return, they switch to the January cohort because um, they've just been dormant for that term and they continue studying with the January cohort. Um, so again, from the examples around session years, um, we know that if this provider offers a September and a January intake, they would need to have session years set up uh, for each of those intakes. So they've got session year starting in September and session year starting in January. So when the student moves between the two cohorts, they also need to move between the two session years. So they start off, um, they're a September starter, um, and so they'd have a student course session returned starting uh, in September associated with session year one. Um, but as of the 15th of December, they're taking an agreed break in learning um, and they returned to study in March 2021. So they completed their first term. They then missed the next term. So when they're returning um, to study, they will be joining the January cohort. So in that case, when they return to study, they will now be associated with session year two. So they'd have a new student course session returned starting on the 15th of March when they started studying and continuing until um, they finish engaging with that year of the course. So again, um, they're joining the January cohort that started, well, this is it's fairly unlikely it started on the 1st of January, but it started in January. Um, but they only beginning to engage with the January cohort on the 15th of March. So their student course session starts on the 15th of March and then continues um, along with the other students on that year. So the advantage that this gives um, is that it uh, gives that context as to why the student has these shorter student course sessions. Um, what we know from discussions with yourselves, with such three customers, is that there's a need to be able to chunk up student activity into year long periods of time. Um, and so in this example, the student would have one little student course session lasting a couple of months, September to December, and then a gap and then another one in March. So if we didn't have the session years. We wouldn't be able to see what would happen there. Um, because we do, we can see that the student was originally on the September cohort. They've taken a break and they've come back in the January cohort. And that then allows the provider to um, from this point, continue to return the students on the same uh, schedule and dates as other students in the January cohort. So their next student course session will start in January 2022 and it can continue uh, in that way.
Um, the final example I will run through is you've got a student that's studying on a fully flexible or a postgraduate research programme. So as I've said, um, session years don't apply to these courses because they don't have the concept of a planned start date. Students can start at any point in the year. Um, so there'll be no so, um, session year associated with the student course sessions. So instead what we'll see is from the point that the student starts, a student course session is returned with the start date reflecting that date that the student starts and year long student course sessions will be returned from that point until the student finishes. So if student one started on their fully flexible program on the 1st of March, they'd get a student course session that runs from the 1st of March to the 28th of February the following year. Student two uh, signed up on the 1st of June. So they'd have a student course session from the 1st of June to 31st of May the following year. And they continue um, to have these year long student course sessions until they finish. And the final student course session end date reflects the date that they finished. So because we don't have those session years, giving those uh, kind of year long brackets of, of time, um, the student course sessions must then be um, a year long recording the, the student's activity in those year long chunks. Um, I will just pause there and see if there are any questions on those. Yeah, we've got one that um, came in a little bit ago. Um, can more than one venue be returned for each course session? Uh, yes, so if the student has activity in one student course session across multiple venues, um, then you would see uh, there's the entity that links the two together is called study location. So um, student course session would have multiple study locations linked to the different venues um, with a proportion saying, say they spent 50% at venue A and 50% at venue B. Great, thank you. Um, I will carry on then around the student course session. So I've kind of gone through what the student course session is and the principles. Um, it's the way of chunking up a student's activity into uh, each year of study um, and it links together that engagement with the course and the session year that the student is interacting with. Um, but what I will do um, next is run through what data is held at the student course session level. Um, so as I said this will be quite high level and lots of these sections are topics of some of our um, subsequent sessions we'll go into in a bit more detail and um, for now I'll give you a bit of a, a whistle stop tour of what we're collecting at, at, the, at the student course session. Um, so the first thing then, we have some fees and funding information. Um, so as part of this, we're collecting who are the funding body or bodies for that student course session, um, whether or not that student course session is fundable. We also have some fee information about how much the student's being charged and um, whether they're in receipt of financial support. Um, and that includes within their um, disabled students allowance and the part-time fee waiver in Wales as well. So we have some fees and funding information um, for the student course session. We also have um, stu supervisor allocation. Um, and again, for those of you familiar with the current return, this is essentially replicating the REF data entity that we have at the moment. So for postgraduate research students, uh, we want to know what are the units of assessments um, associated with the supervisors and who are the supervising organisations. So we can record um, collaborative provision there as well as collecting that, that REF information for the unit of assessments. Uh, we are also interested in the type of activity that the student's undertaking. So are they off on a placement? Are they studying abroad? Are they doing a foundation year? Are they doing a bridging course? That kind of thing. So um, not just uh, the volume of their activity, but also the type of activity that they're undertaking. We have location um, information here as well. And this is where the student course session links back to that venue entity. And um, as we have from the question previously, it could link to multiple venues if the student is studying at multiple venues. Um, it also um, can rather be associated with the venue. It could be off venue activity. So again, um, like with the type of activity, if they're on a placement or they're studying abroad, um, they wouldn't necessarily be linked to a venue we would have an off venue activity record returned for them to give some information about where they are and what they're doing. And then finally, we have 
um, some mode and FTE information. So we collect the mode, are they full-time, are they part-time? We have a um, new mode that we've added in for Data Futures of Accelerated, so we can record if they're on an accelerated course. Um, we also have the um, a, a way of recording the status of a student course session. So separate to the mode, um, we can record that the student course session has a status of dormant, um, and also if it has a status of writing up as well. And then we additionally have the FTE information. So uh, what's the full-time equivalence? And that's what we can record then the intensity of the student's study. So as I've said, the student course session is where the kind of bulk of the information is about what type of activities are students undertaking, um, what's their mode, where are they doing it, how much are they being charged, and broken down into those year-long um, chunks of activity that the students undertaking. So that is the student course session. Um, in the same way the student course session as I said says as part of this engagement the student is interacting with this course. The next entity the module instance um, says that as part of that student course session these are the modules that the student is engaging with. So again it's linking um, something about the student to the curriculum that they're engaging with. So it says which modules the student um, is studying on. So as I said, it's the child of the student course session and it records the modules that the student is studying on as part of that student course session. It is um, mod modular data from Data Futures will be optional for postgraduate research students. And this came out of one of the consultations that Rachel mentioned earlier, um, where we know at the moment that for PGR students, providers often return kind of dummy modules when the concept of modules don't necessarily apply. So we've now made that optional. Um, so they don't have to continue to return essentially fake modules um, for their PGR students. Um, on the module instance itself, we have start and end dates. Um, I mentioned that uh, fees can be returned against the student course session, but they can also be returned uh, for the module instance if fees are charged at a modular level. So the providers have the option to record the fees in the way that best reflects the way that they charge it. So if they charge per module, the fees recorded here. We have some language information for um, Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales about the language that was delivered in. And we have some information about the outcome and results. So did the student complete that module? And um, where relevant, did they gain the, the credits they were aiming for? There are a couple of um, new concepts on the module instance that I just wanted to pick out in particular. So we have this field, the inactive module field. Um, <clears throat> so this would be returned if there was no FTE um, that was attributable to that given module instance. And this might be in cases where, for example, um, the module instance is being returned uh, purely to record the result. They did all of their activity in a previous student course session, for example, um, and this module instance is just recording the outcome, or if the student's just resetting the exams um, rather than resetting the full module, um, then this flag says there's no activity um, as part of this given module instance. And we also have um, the continuing module field. And what this tells us is whether or not um, students continuing the module that started in a previous student course session. So just for a little bit of context around that one, um, we have a rule that module instances cannot span student course sessions. Um, so in a hypothetical situation, you've got a student with two student course sessions, um, each being a year of their activity, but they study a module that spans across both of those student course sessions. Um, because we need the activity to be broken down into these chunks of the student course session, we would need them to return one module instance for the first half of that module and another for the second half of that module. And so what they return for the first one is um, an outcome saying the student's going to continue that module in the next student course session. And then on the second one, that's when they'd have that continuing field to say that the student is continuing that module from the previous student course session. Um, and that's helpful um, to be able to see that the module spans those two student, two student course sessions um, to make sure we're not double counting anything. For example, that fee information or the FTE um, that would be returned in both 
um, we can see that it started in a previous student course session and so we don't double count that information. So that is what we collect um, for the module instance. And um, the final part then that I will run through is the leaving information. So the writers got sent us all their curriculum data, they return the student and engagement, um, and then the student course sessions and module instances record all of the activity the students undertaking. Um, they'd have one student course session for each year, and then at the end, um, they give us the leaving information, and that is associated with the engagement. So what we're interested in when they leave is when did they leave? Why did they leave? Did they get a qualification? Uh, so at the engagement level, we have a lever entity and that contains the end date. So that's the when did they leave and a reason for ending. So that's the why did they leave? Um, we have an additional field in there for the intended destination. Um, and that is uh, only applicable to postgraduate research students who are transferring out as part of a formal collaborative arrangement. So if the student, a PGR student is moving between two providers, uh, the first provider <clears throat> would put the UKPRN, the second provider in that intended destination field. Um, so that's the lever entity. Separate to that, at the engagement level, we also have a qualification awarded entity. And this is then where we record, did they gain any qualifications? So the qual ID returned here, would be the unique identifier for the qualification that I spoke about right at the beginning of this. And so that tells us um, what is the qualification that they've gained. So first degree, HND, um, PUCE, et cetera. Um, and because it's linking back to that qualification, we therefore also have the associated awarding body and subjects of that qualification. Uh, then we get qualification result. <laughs> Um, so that might be a first, a 2-1, a 2-2, it might be a pass. Um, and then we have a new optional field of a thesis title, again, for PGR students that can be returned. Um, the final thing then is um, also associated with that qualification awarded is the qualification award accreditation. So I've mentioned accreditation a couple of times where we collect whether or not the student is aiming for any accreditation. This is where we record whether or not they achieved that accreditation. So, for example, if we know that they were aiming for qualified teacher status as part of their course, then when they finish and, and gain a qualification, we need to know whether or not they achieved that qualified teacher status. And that would be recorded here. Um, final note then that the lever entity um, it's deliberately separate to the qualification awarded entity. So qualification awarded would also be returned for interim awards. So you might see a qualification awarded with no lever entity. But between these entities, you've then got, when did the student leave? Why did they leave? And did they gain any qualifications? Um, and that then is your sort of whistle stop tour of the new data futures model. Um, Slight apologies, I thought that last section would take a bit longer, so um, it was a bit of a lopsided session with the break. Um, but I'm happy to take any questions now um, or after if, if you, they come to you later. Um, now there is the engage, engagement entity. When would a student change NUMHUS? Uh, so a student would change NUMHUS um, if they were to move between different engagements. So, um, for example, if I mentioned they would need a new engagement if they transferred between courses at different levels. So the first engagement would have had, say, a numpass of one, and then when that was closed and a new one opened, they'd have a new numpass of two. Um, similarly, if they, say, complete one course with a provider, so they do a first degree, for example, and then come back to do a master's, that would be a new engagement. Um, and so would have a new numpass. So it's the case of they retain the same numpass um, whilst they're on the same engagement. And then when they get a new engagement, they get a new numpass. Brilliant. Thank you. I think um, that's all we've got in um, for the moment. Thank you, everybody. And enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much.